Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the webinar organized jointly by the Committee on Equality and Non-Discrimination and the Parliamentary Network, Women Free from Violence of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. Uh, my name is Margreet de Boer. I'm the rapporteur for uh, the report um, talking about, and I also will moderate the first part of the session. The Assembly is sometimes described as the democratic conscience of Europe. Our members come from the national parliaments of the 46 member states of the Council of Europe, and we work together through interparliamentary dialogue to guarantee the values of human rights, democracy, and the rule of law, which are at the heart of all the Council of Europe's activities. Combating violence against women in all its forms is a crucial part of these efforts. The Assembly plays a strong role through its parliamentary network of women free from violence in promoting the ratification and implementation of the gold standard in this field, the Istanbul Convention. Today's webinar forms part of the Assembly's work on emerging and important issue in this field. It is an issue that most often affects women and that may lead to breaches of several human rights instruments, including the European Convention on Human Rights and the Istanbul Convention. And that issue is marital captivity. The first part of today's webinar will explore what marital captivity is, the many forms that it can take, and the way in which the Istanbul Convention could, at least in some cases, come into play. In the second part of the webinar, we'll look more at prevention and protection aspects with contributions from NGOs that are active in these areas. Um, and I first uh, uh, I switch now from my moderator uh, a role to the uh, a rapporteur role. Uh, I will explain what uh, we are dealing with. Um, and uh, I talk about uh, why we need uh, to talk about marital captivity, what it is, uh, how it's linked to forced marriage, uh, how it can be linked to religion, but not always isn't the impact it has and some of the solutions. Um, I try to do it very briefly to give uh, enough time to that. Why do we need to talk about marital captivity? The first reason is quite simply that it is real uh, and uh, many women are affected by it. Yet it remains largely hidden from public, public awareness and public policy making. Second, it brings very uh, many human rights violations. And third, even though it bears some similarities to forced marriage, the solutions uh, provided by law for cases of forced marriage are not always adapted to resolving marital captivity. And in short, we have real human rights problems, real people impacted, and for the moment, not many real solutions. So it's time for action. And what do we mean when we talk about marital captivity? It arises when a person no longer consents to being in their marriage, but they are unable to put an end to it. And the lack of consent to stay married makes it similar to forced marriage, which is prohibited under international. And thanks to the Istanbul Conventions, the intentional act of forcing a person to enter into a marriage or to travel abroad for this purpose is increasingly prohibited under national criminal laws too. Marital captivity can also involve intentional conduct, the most obvious examples being where the other party to the marriage or other family members exert pressure on the person who wants to leave the marriage, making it extremely difficult for them to leave. That pressure can include economic coercion, psychological pressure or threats, threats of violence, including so-called honor crimes. But other situations of marital captivity have no similarity to uh, forced marriage. They can result simply from inadequate legal provisions or inconsistencies between different national legal systems. So a person may marry in one country, then later divorce in a second country. If that divorce is not recognized in the first country, they can face enormous problems. And there has been a lot of academic work done to map the situations that can give rise to marital captivity, and I'm not going to detail those now. But what is important 
is that we have to find solutions for the problems. In some cases, making sure that parties have equal access to civil divorce and that it is fully recognized will be enough to resolve their situations. In other situations, for example, if a person has entered a religious marriage, a civil divorce may not be enough to put an end to their religious marriage in their own eyes or in the eyes of the community. And these situations are more, much more complex in public po policy terms. And our first two speakers will have plenty of insights for us to, on this issue. Um, a few words on uh, um, religion and marital captivity. Certain religions, or more precisely, certain interpretations of religious law or text do not allow for divorce, or they require the permission of the other, usual male partner. And there may also be rules in place that limit a spouse's, and in particular a wife's, capacity to seek divorce. Some examples include um, Jewish marriage is, and uh, the Get, which is a document that the husband must, must give his wife to finalize the divorce under Jewish law. Um, where this practice is followed strictly, it gives the husband a great deal of leverage and power allowing him to prevent the divorce uh, or delay it for long periods. Jewish feminist uh, activists have already been extremely active in finding solutions to these situations. Um, and we have no speaker uh, less today on this, but I'll be examining this uh, further in my report too. Um, Islamic marriages can be ended more easily by the husband than by the wife. Um, and uh, we will hear about that uh, later today. Also in Hindu marriages, uh, that uh, can, very be, uh, can be very complex, uh, as many believers uh, believe that it cannot be uh, undone at all. And also in Christian marriages, there uh, may, result, may be very, uh, problems. The Roman Catholic Church does not recognize divorce uh, officially. Uh, and also uh, in Protestant uh, uh, religions, there can be uh, a lot of pressure uh, to stay within the marriage. Something that's common to all religions and which we must not overlook as legislators, uh, even if we do not hold religious beliefs ourselves, is that for strong believers, leaving their marriage may also mean turning their backs on their entire community and support networks. This can make it extremely hard to leave, and even more so if they don't have access to information about their rights and about support that may be available. It is not only a religion that uh, uh, leads to a mar a marital captivity. Um, there are also different laws uh, in different countries, uh, um, and uh, there's a lot of family pressure uh, there can be also. Um, I'm going um, to the impact. Marital captivity um, is an infringement of the trapped spouse's personal autonomy, and it's a basic principle of human rights law. Women trapped in marital captivity lose their independence and their right to self-determination. They often cannot start a new relationship or remarry as they may be considered by their community to have to committed adultery or by to me then, which may attract drastic consequences for them. Their family may also be pressured to persuade them to uh, the disobedient woman to conform to the expectation of the community of her husband's family. The impact on children may also be devastating as they grow up in an unsafe and unstable environment. Women who try to put an end to the situation can find themselves alone and isolated from their own community and can encounter serious violence and threats. These can include the risk of unabased violence, as I mentioned earlier. Marital captivity, this raises many human rights issues. Um, under the European Convention of Roman Rights, I would mention in particular Article 5, the right to liberty and security of the person, Article 8, the right to private and family life, Article 12, the right to marry, and Article 14, the prohibition on discrimination. 
Um, our discussant at the end of the first session will explore the very important question of how the Istanbul Convention can come into play in many situations of marital captivity. And this is also a crucial part of our discussion and part of the ways forward. I'd like to end this presentation by underlining that once we have understood the situation, the main purpose of my report is to raise awareness and to help to find solutions to the human rights issues raised by marital captivity. And I'm very much looking forward to the input for the speakers uh, who I now will introduce to you. Um, and we are very honored, honored to have uh, three eminent speakers for the first session. Um, first, Shirin Musa, uh, director of Fem for Freedom. It's an NGO which has been leading the way in bringing marital captivity to the attention of decision makers in a growing number of countries around Europe. Our second speaker is uh, Kim Le Coyer. I hope I pronounce it well, who is a researcher and lecturer at the Center of Family Studies of Odyssey University of Applied Sciences as well as an affiliated postdoctoral researcher at Gens University Human Rights Center. She's also the chair of Karama Europe, Muslim Women Lawyers for Human Rights. And to round out the speakers for the first session, we have as our discussant Francesca Montagna, administrator in the Secretariat of the Group of Experts on Action Against Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence, better known as CRAVIO. Welcome to all the speakers, and um, I'm going to turn straight to Shira Musa now to get the session started. Uh, uh, Mrs. Musa, Shirin, uh, your organization, Femme for Freedom, has been very active in the Netherlands for a number of years now, in drawing attention to the problem of marital captivity, and you've also carried out advocacy at European level, notably through the European Parliament. Femme for Freedom has also been active in pushing for legal change in the Netherlands in this field. Can you tell us more about the forms of marital captivity that your organization focuses on? Who marital captivity can affect the impact in practical and human rights terms that it can have in women's lives in particular? And perhaps if there's time, explain some of the legal avenues that you have been exploring to try to eliminate this situation. You have the floor for approximately eight to ten minutes, Sharon. I hope she is still there. I don't see her any. Does anybody know where Sharon has gone? Now, then I suggest uh, to give Sharon the time uh, to get back to us, which you hopefully uh, uh, will, uh, to turn the speakers around. Uh, so I. Oh, there is, there is Sharon. Okay. Sharon, you have the floor. Yes, thank you very much um, for the introduction um, and, and this invitation. Um, well, I have a very short time to speak. Where you already said so much about uh, marital captivity and the uh, importance um, for awareness raising and also the impact uh, on uh, women. Um, I started Fun for Freedom uh, uh, more than 10 years ago because um, I experienced marital captivity in the Netherlands. And uh, I have a legal background, but I never uh, completed my law study. And when I was at university, I asked many professors for help, but they said that there was no solution, um, but that they did recognize the situation and that they were aware that marital captivity is a big issue in um, when it comes to marriage and divorce in the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, um, but also um, in international literature, they call uh, marital captivity also a limping marriage or it's a form of a marital captivity um, and fun for freedom it is especially uh, it is it is it is established to uh, focus specifically on uh, marital captivity 
um, uh, consequences of marital captivity um, and how many forms of marital captivity uh, we have. Um, there are uh, marital from uh, a forced marriage. If you are forced into a marriage and if you are forced to continue the marriage, then it is, of course, marital captivity. But uh, marital captivity also um, exists when uh, you have entered your marriage voluntarily, and um, when later in uh, when when you divorce, that the husband does not want to uh, cooperate in uh, in the religious marriage. Um, if we talk about religion, um, you know, I mean, it, like, like like you also said, there are also. Um, it's, it's also about religion, but it's also about the law. It's about marriage and divorce. Muslim women um, in Islam, um, a civil marriage without um, mahar, uh, it's not uh, um, uh, is not recognized. So you must marry according to Islamic law, except in uh, according to the law of they do accept it civil marriage. A marriage is only recognized when the mahar is stipulated. So when we talk about um, divorce, uh, you also have to divorce according to religion or to the laws of uh, the country where you have married. For example, Pakistan. Pakistan if, you, if you marry in Pakistan, then um, your religious marriage is also a civil marriage. If you come back to the Netherlands and if you register your marriage, it becomes um, a civil marriage. Um, so there are many forms of uh, of marriage to marry according to religion. Otherwise, it will not be recognized according to the country of origin or according to the to the to the norms of your community. And the same is with uh, marital captivity. Um, the consequences uh, it could lead to uh, honor related violence. There is a very famous case nowadays in in Spain. It's also highlighted in uh, in uh, British. Uh, uh, newspapers, two sisters who were forced into a marriage. Um, they wanted to end that marriage. They went to Pakistan because they thought that that was the only way. Their husbands lived in Pakistan and then they were killed by their family. Um, so there is a causality with, uh, with forced marriage, uh, but not always. Um, there is also a big difference in, uh, in evidence. Um, you can easily prove marital captivity, while you cannot easily prove um, a forced marriage. Um, and when we talk about uh, marital captivity in, uh, in the Netherlands, it is recognized uh, in, in the law within the article of force. Um, we, we also have um, a legal aid. Um, we give le legal aid assistance and advice to women who the women who are in marital captivity are often more willing to report a case while women, um, but also men who are victims of first marriage, they do not want to report a case because um, eh, most of the times they are forced into a marriage by their family um, members. And um, if we talk about also must not forget our own European history, because even in Europe, um, if I tell the situation of my own country, the Netherlands, until 1972, divorce was not recognized um, in our law. Um, until 1972, um, uh, divorce, uh, you, you could only divorce if you accuse the other of adultery. And adultery was also a crime in the Netherlands. So the same is in many other European countries that because of the influence of religion, people could not divorce. But we had um, the Cultural Revolution in the 60s and 70s. And um, the, the output was also um, that women um, and men uh, could, enjoy, could, could enjoy equal rights and also the rights to divorce. Except in 2011, even in Malta, divorce was not allowed. And nowadays at Philippines, so um, it is important um, that, that we realize that there are so many forms of marital captivity. It exists in each religious traditions and the consequences are immense. Women cannot remarry uh, without consequences or they cannot travel to their country of origin. They cannot extend their passport or apply for a new passport without the permission of the husband or they need the permission of the husband to leave the country, the country of origin. Um, and um, it also
I'm afraid we lost connection with Shirin. Let's wait for a minute if she comes back. Yes, there she is. Hello, I'm back. We yes, and then the, the the latest thing, the last thing is about the male guardianship. Um, that uh, it also has a big impact on on uh, women who suffer from marital captivity. It does not only exist in other countries uh, like uh, or or uh, um, Iran or or Egypt. But it also has impact on us, on migrant women. And um, um, do you hear me? I don't know whether I still am connected. Hello. Yeah. I am not connected. Now you are connected yes. again. We lost. Okay, you for I am connected again. Okay. Yeah. Um. Well. So did did you <laughs> hear what I said about the male guardianship? Hello, uh, about the male guardianship. When you, when you were back, when you started okay. about the male uh, guardianship, okay. you were back. Yeah. The, the male guardianship, I mean, that we missed. The, the, yes, the thing is, is that here in Europe, we do have equal rights on paper. But when we um, travel to our countries or the impact of the laws on our countries are very immense. If we want to renew our passports or um, if we want to go back to our countries, our husbands, in, when it's when they can stop us to leave the country. It also, um, the solution lies also in diplomacy that our countries talk to um, other countries where men and women don't have equal rights in marriage and divorce. And I have an example uh, for you, that's the, the, the Mulavana. Um, in 2004, when the new Mudawana was launched, finally, foreign divorce verdicts were also, um, there is an article that they also recognize foreign divorce verdicts. So it's also important that we do talk with other countries um, so that um, they support women's rights organization who fights for gender equality, and also that we uh, keep dialogue uh, with them so that they uh, do think of, um, and to conclude, um, well, we, we have a, a, a website. I will share it in the chat group. We also have, uh, we, we also organized a hearing about marital captivity in the European Parliament. So we have um, practical solutions about it. And we make brochures for um, integration courses and language courses so that we can inform men and women what they can do when they uh, experience marital captivity. I don't know whether I am online or not. Hello. Yes, you are. <laughs> okay. Yes, you are. So this uh, and and the rest I will share in um, in the chat uh, group and on Facebook Live. Um, also about uh, the discussions on uh, religion, whether it's religion about the freedom of religion and about the separation of church and state. Well, we do have the responsibility um, to uh, find solutions for this these women to raise awareness and also. Um, had to, uh, to to take uh, to to recognize it in our law, but we need much more. Um, but I'm I'm happy that we have this webinar today so that we can discuss and that it will raise more awareness to this uh, big injustice. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Shirin. Um, and also, well, I'd like it very much that you both uh, mention uh, um, examples, uh, real life examples, so we know what it's going about, but also thinking about solutions in uh, diplomacy, but also talking about that it's it's needed that we have, have a no fault uh, divorce uh, everywhere in Europe. Thank you very much. Um, now I turn to uh, Ms. Le Coyer. Um, um, your research has covered a wide range of issues, but one of the areas of interest 
uh, is your work on conflicts within Muslim families in Belgium and the ways in which factors uh, such as lack of legal awareness and sometimes perceived conflicts between legal and religious norms can affect the way people navigate those situations. Um, divorce is certainly one of the most important types of family dispute and often one of the most conflictual. Um, as our previous speaker mentioned, um, marital captivity can affect women from all religious backgrounds. Um, so I want to underline uh, that by inviting you to talk today about your research involving Muslim families, we are absolutely not suggesting that these are the only families uh, where marital captivity can arise. On the contrary, what we do hope to do, uh, however, is to learn and understand more about what some families may face and how these issues can be resolved. It's my pleasure to give you the floor. Thank you very much for that. <clears throat> I'm, um, I'm really honored to be a part of this important meeting. It's, um, it's, it's, it's really encouraging to see um, that uh, this important issue is being put uh, on the agenda um, and uh, that, that we are able to have uh, and take this opportunity to, to reflect together in order to find avenues leading to, um, to possible solutions. Um, indeed, I will be talking mostly on the basis of my doctoral research. Um, but I'm also, um, as, as you already said, um, uh, while introducing me, I'm uh, also active uh, in a Muslim women's uh, organization that is um, promoting human rights um, at the grassroots uh, level. And, um, and I think the combination of both the academic uh, knowledge and, um, and the experience at the grassroots level coming together um, allows me to, to provide uh, interesting empirical material so that we can better understand what are the uh, dynamics at play and um, how this information can allow us to uh, effectively tackle um, issues uh, that are at stake. So I, I will try to share a few slides so that what I'm telling is easier to be followed. Hopefully this works well. Uh, so this was the title of um, my doctoral dissertation that I just defended exactly a month ago at Ghent University um, uh, where I was doing research at the um, uh, Human Rights Center. And um, my research was a social legal inquiry, uh, so really focusing on um, on, on the level of, of practices concerning conflict handling within Belgian Muslim families. But uh, as you already rightfully um, highlighted, it's important that marital captivity is not just an issue of Muslim women. However, focusing on concrete examples in the lives of Belgian Muslim women allows us to understand a number of dynamics that um, can lead to, uh, to avenues for solutions that might be applicable way beyond the sole um, uh, case of Muslim women as I hopefully will be able to uh, to demonstrate. So can I move the slides? Okay, so I, I will briefly talk about four elements here. Um, first, I will be uh, very briefly introducing the doctoral research in itself. Um, the different situations of marital captivity that come forward. Um, I will share a few descriptive findings focusing especially on human rights implications and then I will share my recommendations uh, with you. So my doctoral research was a social legal inquiry into women's rights within Belgian law related family conflicts in Belgian Muslim families. It was a social legal uh, research. So on the one hand, I collected about um, collected and analyzed about 70 personal narratives of mainly women um, that had faced or were still facing a situation of uh, family conflict. And um, we will see in the different uh, situations that I will briefly describe that in many cases, these were marital conflicts and sometimes um, there were situations of marital captivity. On the other end, I also uh, conducted and analyzed um, interviews with um, different types of field workers. 
um, religious actors and imams were an important um, part of this. And I uh, also did some document analysis in order to understand particularly um, how religious norms were playing a role in these situations of family conflict. So the focus was not uh, specifically on marital captivity, but it was an important aspect of it. And especially in terms of human rights, it was one of the most uh, important challenges, if, if not the most important uh, human rights challenge. Um, I focused very much on intersectionality as a method uh, to be able to grasp the complexity of minority women's lives. And I, I will try very briefly to show how important that is, that we really use intersectionality, intersectional theory and intersectional approaches um, to, uh, to, to grasp and be able to tackle issues that relate to minority women's lives because they uh, literally stand at the crossroads of different types of um, social exclusion. And uh, that is very important if, if, if we want to empower women um, to, um, to be able to, um, to, to, to handle the challenges that, um, specific challenges that they are, are facing at this crossroads. Um, what I found in my research, just in one sentence, is that the main challenge for human rights was the non-take-up of legally protected rights, specifically access to divorce. So we're really into uh, marital captivity. So there are different forms of marital captivity that came forward. There can be issues of legal recognition of divorce, and um, uh, Shireen uh, already referred to that, and when you, you, you need to have your divorce that is legally valid in, um, um, in, in a, a country of origin, for instance, and there might be issues that relate to, um, to that. So that's mostly issues of international private law. I will not go into, um, into that particular um, aspect. Then there are uh, situations of limping religious divorce. And there can be um, basically two, two types of situations. There can be a religious divorce that took place on top of a civil, um, um, a religious marriage that took place on top of a civil marriage. And so we have a, a civil marriage, uh, which provide access in general to civil divorce, especially if it's a marriage that was concluded by a resident of um, European countries, according to um, the law of, um, of a member state. Um, and there is possibility to dissolve uh, the civil marriage eh, according to the law of um, a member state, then it might be that the situation of marital captivity relates to the fact that the religious uh, um, marriage is considered to still be valid and not yet dissolved. It can also be that no civil marriage was concluded. And so this can be referred to situations of religious only marriages. And there, of course, the importance of uh, religious divorce um, is very important because it's the only way to dissolve um, this, um, this, this marriage. Of course, legally speaking, if there is no, um, no legally valid um, marriage, um, sometimes it's really not a matter of, um, of legal access to divorce, but it could be important in terms of remarriage. Uh, if, if one feels trapped in a, a religious relationship, um, engaging into a new relationship, especially for women, could be highly problematic because this could be considered to be adultery and children that would be born outside this new relationship could be within a specific religious uh, and social communities and be considered to be um, um, unlawful uh, children. So we see uh, that there can be um, different situations of limping uh, religious divorces, uh, limping religious marriage, actually. Um, and finally, there are situations of marital captivity that are actually due to social, the social costs of separation or divorce, uh, where women actually remain de facto captives of an unhappy or sometimes even an abusive marital relationship because um, taking the step to um, try to dissolve the marriage is, um, is at a, a cost that is too high. 
socially speaking. So I will very briefly go into uh, a number of specific issues. So a core concept here is the concept of internormativity. Uh, what we see is that family life, and that's not just for Muslims, um, family life and family conflicts involve a combination of different layers of conceptions, norms and rules about what is just, what is the right thing to do, and what are the rights that one has. And of course, uh, legal conceptions, um, national law can play a role, very often combined to social norms and religious norms. So what then specifically is the role of Islamic normativity? Uh, there are religious discourses that circulate, and these provide um, power to parties in disputes. And there are many different interpretations um, of Islamic norms concerning, for instance, divorce. And um, this leads to a plurality of pos uh, possible situations of, um, of marital captivity. And then finally, we found that uh, there was kind of a wall of separation between professional and legal actors to which uh, women in situations of marital captivity uh, turn to. And these are specialized in, um, in legal aspects. In th They look at the issue from a very secular perspective. And then on the other hand, concerning the religious aspects of the situation, people tend to turn to religious actors who then only look at the religious aspects of the problem. And there are no integrated solutions. There is a lack of, of collaboration. There really is a wall of separation between the two. Whereas looking at internormativity, we see that actually the, um, uh, the conflict situations at stake involve an entanglement of legal and religious elements. And in order to be able to disentangle this, it's important that these types of actors work together in order to find solutions. So um, in the end, what is what makes the difference is the emergence of a rights consciousness uh, that women, that are being trapped in uh, a marriage for whatever reason, uh, see themselves as rights-bearing persons and that they try to take up rights that in general are legally protected. Uh, and especially in the case of Belgium, we found that uh, legal protection was sufficient, but um, it, it was the fact that um, some women were not sure that they were actually entitled to use these rights um, as Muslim women, that was preventing them from having access to, um, to especially religious divorce. But sometimes also that prevented them from engaging into a civil divorce. And so there are complex self-positioning dynamics that are taking place within families, communities, and society, and we need to be aware of this. Sometimes women try to position themselves as, I have the right to ask for uh, uh, a divorce, uh, you uh, have a, um, a legal and a moral and a religious obligation as my husband to grant me a religious divorce, for instance, uh, but they're not always able to, um, to secure that right if there are, for instance, social pressures taking place within communities or families. So, uh, if we look at the human rights uh, implications, it's important that we move beyond this idea that law and religion are necessarily opposed. Uh, we, we found that in reality, um, actually both state law systems and Islamic normativity both contain disabling and enabling elements. And in each particular case, it's important to look at where are enabling elements, where are disabling elements and to try to, uh, to use these elements in order to find a, a, a solution. And the most enabling factor is this contextually situated capacity that women uh, might display to harmonize multiple um, normative repertoires and multiple subject positions. So basically that means seeing myself as a citizen bearing rights and at the same time as a good Muslim woman. And that what I'm doing uh, is protecting my rights under uh, both these normative frameworks. So what we need is bottom-up approaches 
um, and I'll move to recommendations uh, right away. So we need to, to make a shift in mindset um, where we really depart from the lived realities, try to look at concrete cases. Um, th there will be no um, solution um, that fits all cases. Huh? There are different types of realities and we need to look at the different categories of situations in order to be able to, um, to, to find concrete solutions. So in terms of remedies, I think uh, one of the main things is to break this wall of separation between different spheres, uh, the religious sphere and the legal sphere. Um, we need to bring together different areas of expertise, build networks of experts, um, specifically uh, render uh, access to religious divorce more easy. And uh, there can be um, uh, different ways to do this, specifically in terms of legal solutions. Um, in the Netherlands in particular, there have been uh, experiences with using tort actions against recalcitrant husbands. Mm -hmm. So that could be an interesting uh, legal avenue, mm -hmm. though it depends on whether in the particular case, that is the obstacle or not, because sometimes it's not because of the husband um, that the, a woman is trapped in a religious marriage. It could be because the woman herself um, feels that uh, she has no right to file for divorce. And, and then of course, a tort action is not going to be um, the solution. I think training on this specific issue is um, is very important and um, investing in preventive solutions that um, that involve dialogue with grassroots organizations such as, for instance, um, Fund for Freedom or, um, or, or Karana Europe. So I'll leave it at that for the moment. I'm, I'm, I would be happy if there are any questions to look uh, more specifically into uh, particular dynamics or specific avenues for solutions that I, um, I have been able to, to, to look at. Thank you yeah. very much. Thank you very much. I think it was most, most interesting. Uh, that's why I let it go for a few minutes more. I'm sorry, um, that was a little longer. No, it, it, it's, it's okay. It was really interesting. Um, and I, I now turn to uh, Ms. Montagna, Francesca Montagna. Um, you have a degree in law and you work as an administrator in the Secretariat of Grevio, uh, which is responsible for monitoring the implementation of the Istanbul Convention. Um, and the words marital captivity don't appear ex explicitly anywhere in the Istanbul Convention. But a question that we are very keen to explore today is how and in what circumstances this convention could apply uh, to situations of marital captivity and how states could use its provisions to strengthen protection in this field. It's my pleasure to give you the floor. Thank you very much um, for this question and for giving me and the Secretariat the opportunity to intervene on, on this issue. And I will try to um, uh, portray the angle that can be taken uh, under the Istanbul Convention. So I'll start first by referring to some of the relevant standards of the Convention. Um, and then I will explain whether and to what extent these standards can apply to the issue of uh, marital captivity. Um, so, first of all, Article 37 of the Istanbul Convention, um, as is also, has also been described in the information report, uh, the background report um, to this discussion, defines forced marriage as the intentional conduct of forcing an adult or a child to enter into a marriage, but also the luring of an adult or a child to another state with the purpose of forcing him or her um, to enter into a marriage. Um, and, and then requires these conducts to be criminalized. Another relevant provision is Article 32 of the Convention um, that uh, requires state parties to take legislative or other measures to ensure that marriages concluded um, under force may be voidable, annulled, or dissolved without undue financial or administrative burden placed on the victim. So Article 37 of the Convention um, does not establish or address the right to end a marriage uh, or the right to divorce um, and would not therefore directly cover the types of situations um, described in the information memorandum um, as marital captivity, or at least wouldn't cover some of them. Um, this provision only refers to the moment of the conclusion of the marriage, um, including the events leading up to the conclusion. Um, and as a result, this is why also Grevier reports have not really referred to the concept of marital captivity um, or issued findings in, in this respect. 
this notwithstanding, um, there is one scenario in particular that um, may be uh, where uh, perhaps it is interesting to, to look at from the angle of the convention. Um, and that is uh, cases where the person is trapped in a marriage that is not recognized by law, but which is considered to be valid in the victim's community, for example. So one consideration um, might be of interest. And um, in some of its reports, uh, Grevio has noted the, the tendency of certain states to view forced marriages that have been celebrated according to communities' own customs or traditions um, as not prompting the application of criminal law um, because they're seen as a cultural issue that the authorities have no control over. Uh, we've seen this in, in Malta and uh, Serbia, for example, the, the, the reports are, are public and on our website. So in these cases, um, Grevio has issued findings calling state parties to ensure that traditional forced marriages do not remain unpunished and that the relevant criminal law provisions prohibiting forced marriage be applied also in these cases. And um, also recalling something that was said previous by um, the intervener, uh, by the speaker, um, it is important to train criminal justice actors uh, accordingly to um, also uh, intervene in these cases of um, forced marriage. More generally, um, again, while the convention doesn't directly address marital captivity, it addresses interrelated aspects. Um, it criminalizes those forms of violence against women that may be perpetrated in connection with what is understood as marital captivity and lays down the relevant preventative protection and prosecution aspects. To give you um, uh, an explanation more, more specifically, um, for example, where the in inability to put an end to the marriage is um, attribut attributable to the conduct of the other spouse, the husband, um, because of psychological pressure exerted, coercion or physical violence, then the articles of the Convention on Psychological Violence or Physical uh, Violence could come into play. Um, uh, the Istanbul Convention does not require the criminalization of economic violence, but this is also um, included in the definition of domestic violence um, of the Convention. So economic violence perpetrated in connection to the phenomenon of uh, marital captivity could be seen as domestic violence under the convention, and this would prompt um, this, uh, the state parties to take the necessary preventative protection as well policy measures. Um, many states also have criminalized um, domestic violence, so this should also be borne to mind. Um, I would like to, to underline, however, that in the Secretariat's view, um, the applicability of the Istanbul Convention would only arise if the refusal to end a marriage forms part of the abusive behavior of the dom domestic violence perpetrator. On the contrary, if there has never been any violence before, um, for example, refusing to sign divorce papers or other similar acts wouldn't necessarily come within the remit of the Convention. Um, then where, where forms of violence against women have been committed, um, the provisions on support services of the Istanbul Convention would of course also be applicable, um, as well as um, other provisions related to prevention, protection uh, and prosecution, as well as integrated policies, as I mentioned before. Um, a second scenario in which the Istanbul Convention may come into play is where a civil divorce has been obtained by the woman, but is not recognized or is not well regarded by her religious community. And as a result, the woman uh, may be subject to harm or to honor-based violence. In that specific case, um, Article 42 of the Convention requires that transgression of culture, custom, religion, tradition, or honor not be legally recognized as a justification of crimes of violence against women and, and that the culprits um, be uh, prosecuted. Finally, a last aspect that uh, I wanted to evoke is um, uh, the, the Article 59 of the Convention, so the right to an autonomous um, uh, residence permit. Uh, under this article, uh, article, state parties must ensure that victims of violence against women whose residence status depends on that of the abusive husband be granted in cases such as domestic violence an autonomous residence permit in the event of the dissolution of the relationship or marriage, regardless of the duration of the marriage or relationship. So this is precisely to avoid that the victim is forced to um, remain in the abusive relationship 
in order to retain her residence status. So um, in cases, I suppose, of, of marital captivity. And, um, and this uh, also has a an, 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 uh, knock-on effect on, on access to children as well, because the, the, the victim, if she doesn't have the right to this um, uh, autonomous residence permit, uh, might have to leave the country. And then, of course, the issue of access to children, custody over children, um, comes into play as well. So I thank you, and uh, I hope this uh, can be useful for, for the discussion. I have to turn on my microphone. Thank you very much uh, for this insight on what the Istanbul Convention can mean and also what it cannot uh, uh, mean. Um, we have uh, uh, a few minutes left uh, also to, to maybe to have some uh, questions from public. Um, so you can uh, you can use the chat function in blue jeans or on Facebook to ask your questions and we can see if we can manage to, uh, uh, to have some uh, questions uh, delivered to our speakers. Uh, but first I want to give uh, our speakers the opportunity to give a reaction to each other or to ask some questions. I don't see uh, Shirin Musa at the moment, so um, I would uh, give the floor to uh, Kim Le Coyer to see if she has any questions uh, to Miss Montagna or want to make some remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much um, for giving me the floor. Um, it, it was really very um, um, insightful to see how um, different categories of uh, situations can uh, fall under um, the um, uh, Istanbul Convention or, or, or not. Um, generally, if there are situations um, that that actually involve criminal uh, actions, uh, it's it's uh, of course um, interesting to, to to see uh, that there are avenues to, um, uh, to 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 criminalize this and to encourage um, um, states in which uh, certain of these. Um, uh, harmful acts would not be criminalized um, to, to encourage them to uh, to criminalize them. I think that's um, a very important um, aspect of um, um, uh, actions that, that need to be taken. Um, however, based on my research specifically in Belgium, um, it was very clear that Criminal, criminalization uh, was not going to be of many help in most situations um, because of the fact that if you really have situations of uh, domestic and or economic uh, violence, generally existing laws uh, already provide um, legal protection that in general is sufficient. So. Um, so, so, so that's where actually being able to take preventive measures becomes uh, becomes very important. And uh, I was wondering whether um, how to, to specifically uh, focus on um, elements of prevention based on, on the Istanbul Convention. Because CEDAW, for instance, clearly uh, in, insists on the fact that, that there is a, a responsibility um, for uh, states to um, to, to actually tackle situations where there could be on the basis of uh, cultural uh, or religious uh, or other traditions, uh, situations that may lead to, um, to violence against women. I was wondering whether uh, you, you could add something about that uh, um, in the Istanbul Convention. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm doing the round to the three of you and then come back to the three of you. So. Um, Shirin, do you have any remarks or questions on uh, what the other speakers uh, told us? Uh, yes, I have. Thank yes, I have. Thank you. Um, well, I have um, something to say about the criminalization. Um, we, uh, like, like I said in my presentation, we have uh, a free legal aid um, assist. We give free legal aid assistance to uh, to women. And most of the times, those are women who are sent to us by imams, by the religious leaders, 
but also uh, by um, even uh, you know um, the, the different uh, domestic uh, uh, violence um, departments and organizations. We call we call it veilig thuis. They don't know how to solve the case. They send the women to us, and we do approximately 60 between 60 and 70 case studies per year. And until now, we had uh, it, it did work in four cases. Until now, it did work um, to go to the police station, um, and it was about um, th those four cases um, where uh, the police did do their job well because it is criminalized in the Netherlands. Was when um, two of uh, the women, um, but also their husbands, didn't have. Um, Dutch nationality. So the police went for mediations and they said, if you do not call. We lost you again. Yes, something. Think... Sorry, okay. something is wrong with my connection. Yeah. Well, I. I okay. uh, to make it very short. In, in two cases, yes. Okay, it does work. In, in some cases, it does work um, when marital captivity is criminalized, um, when there are no children involved, or when the husband uh, is in the process of a Dutch nationality application. And then mediation um, is also an effective tool, um, and also uh, torch procedures and the prevention of marital captivity um, is also very important. Um, like um, that, that we say, and, and um, it is also recognized here in the Netherlands that when you go to the public notary and where you stipulate your religious divorce, it is um, a prevention tool which also exists in the Jewish communities. Um, but uh, we also advocate this for um, the other communities, like the Muslim communities. They, the women, they can stipulate their religious divorce in their nikah documents. But we say to keep uh, to be sure that it is valid. Also, go to the public notary office. Thank you. Uh, we're running out of time, so I give the floor once more uh, uh, Anya, uh to make some uh, maybe concluding comments. Sure. Um, I just thank you very much for the comments and, and, and also questions. Um, I just wanted to clarify once again that uh, the convention as such doesn't criminalize, of course, marital captivity, nor does it recognize its um, existence, um, but it touches upon some aspects. Um, and those aspects, some of those aspects, of course, are criminalized. So, for instance, whether it's um, um, psychological violence, uh, whether it's um, physical violence, uh, whether it's um, forced marriage, but only, uh, once again, uh, w when it comes to the conclusion of the marriage, but not the maintaining and keeping of uh, the marriage. So it doesn't recognize a right to, to have a divorce, essentially. So. Basically, I think the convention can be used to address certain aspects of this phenomenon, which, as has already been uh, highlighted by all the speakers, has very different dimensions. is is you know has different uh, scenarios, different uh, situations, um, and of course, the where the convention can help. Um, it doesn't only address the criminalization um, and prosecution aspect, but of course, prevention, uh, protection, uh, and policies are an extremely important aspect of, of, of the convention. Of course, it, it's based on four pillars. And, um, and so prevention is very important when it comes to awareness raising, education. So of course, we have specific articles addressing awareness raising, tra training of professionals, um, um, and so on. Uh, and education, of course, is, is also very important. And uh, education means uh, educating on, in general, on violence against women, gender-based violence, but um, also on uh, gender equality, uh, on aspects such uh, honor-based violence as well. Um, all, all these uh, topics that surround the issue that you have been speaking about today. So the convention can be relevant from certain angles, on certain aspects um, and could perhaps be used in that way. But once again, it doesn't uh, address specifically marital captivity. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, I want to uh, thank very much again, all of our speakers uh, in this session. Uh, it was uh, were a magnificent uh, contribution 
and uh, it will inspire uh, uh, the, the further work on this, uh, this issue. Thank you. Um, we now will have a short uh, break um, in order to set up the second round of speakers in this webinar and uh, we will be back uh, about 10 uh, after 11. Uh, so thank you uh, for your presence uh, until now and we will be back soon. Thank you. Welcome back to the webinary. Uh, very pleased to join you all on this really important matter. A really important matter close to my heart for personal reasons. I'm really uh, honored to be part of this webinar. I know that the discussion in the first session already brought a lot of useful insights that you explored in depth what material cap capability is and how it affects the lives of those who experience it as well as some of the legal and social avenues that can help to provide. In this part of the webinar, we will focus on prevention and the protection measures, and, the, and particularly from the perspective of uh, civil society. So we will uh, look first at how to reach women in situation of material capital. We know that this can be quite a challenge as they are often very iso uh, isolated and of their rights. And we will look at what kind of support such as women may need in order to be able to actually leave the situation. Then we will look at how to involve finding solution to material captivity as part of the picture of engaging men and combating all forms of uh, violence against women. So we are very pleased and honored to have with us uh, Meltem Weyland, the director of NGO in Vienna, and uh, Jens van Tricht, founder of the manager, uh, managing director and, uh, of Emancipator, which is based in Amsterdam and part of the Global Men Engage Alliance. Um, a very warm welcome to both of you. I'm uh, going to turn straight to uh, Meltem Weyland now to get the session started. Uh, your uh, organi uh, organization is based in Vienna, provides advice, education and shelter for women and girls who need them. Can you tell us a little bit more about what your organization, organization does and especially what kind of advice, practical support do women in situation of material captivity need? Uh, second question, what kind of barriers do they face in gaining access to such um, advice and such support? And how do you help women in such uh, situation to overcome those barriers and get the help uh, that they uh, need? You have the floor. Mrs. Uh, Weyland, we don't hear you. Maybe you need to put your mic on. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> Hello everyone, uh, thank you very much for the invitation and thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, um, as, uh, uh, and thank you for the introduction. Um, actually, I'm not the coordinator of Orient Express. Uh, I am leading the National Coordination uh, Center uh, Against Abduction and Forced Marriage uh, in Austria from Orient Express. Uh, only uh, uh, small information in addition before I start with my with my part. So Orient Express is an association uh, oper uh, is an association and operates in addition to the National Coordination uh, Center Against Abduction and Forced Marriage, a Women Advice Center, a Language Learning Center, and two shelters for girls and young women are threatened or affected by forced marriage or kin-based uh, gender violence. The coordination, uh, the National Coordination Center has been active since 2017 um, and the activities of the Coordination Center includes um, identifying abductions of girls and women uh, and organizing their repatriation uh, to Austria in cooperation with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. 
uh, offering nationwide training courses and events for people who are helping, uh, leading the working group against um, abduction and forced marriage in Austria, an advice service uh, also for professionals, um, and raising awareness and education at all levels of society. Forced marriage is seen as a form of violence. And we have at the coordination center uh, three target groups. Um, we are working with three target groups. There are uh, abductions that are associated with a forced marriage or an abduction uh, as a disciplinary measure. And the third group are uh, women who are resident in Austria and may be left behind abroad after an uh, incident incidents of, of uh, domestic violence. And they, be, they will be uh, left uh, abroad or uh, in the country of origin from their husbands or the family of the husbands. So there are the focus groups uh, at the coordination center. But if we focus on the title of the webinar, webinar today, uh, we might see controversial topics uh, forced marriage, what I was talking about until now, and marital captivity. Uh, but actually, forced the topics, forced marriage, and and uh, being forced to live in a marriage seem to be far apart. But in essence, both topics um, have similar causes. So they are uh, we, are we are putting them together, or or uh, actually we are using several terms or definition in Austria um, as an organization to make it understandable. So we are using the term Zwangsheirat in German. It's being forced to enter into a marriage. It's, uh, it means forced marriage. And we are using Zwangsehe, uh, being forced to remain uh, living in a ma marriage, what means uh, marital captivity. Um, it's important to make the forms, uh, the forms of uh, violence against women visible through the definition, uh, to the correct definition of the terms. Um, from um, our experience in counseling uh, girls and women with a migration uh, background, I can report and explain actually the following backgrounds, um, backgrounds of the marital captivity. And it's, it, there are only just a, a few reasons for it that we are facing in our uh, counseling center on, uh, or uh, during our uh, work. So the first one is the pressure through community, society, and or the family. The second one I'm going to talk about is the lack of the uh, legal regulations, what we call here uh, legal or structural violence, actually. Um, and the third one is, uh, as, as mentioned until yet, is a, a religion or religion uh, marriage as a leverage. Uh, I will. I, I would like to, to give an example about uh, religion as a leverage to, to ha uh, highlight or underline uh, this, this problem. And if, if I, uh, I start with the pressure to the community, uh, society and or the family, um, unfortunately, uh, patriarchal systems, traditional values and rules assigned to the women still mean um, that women cannot break away from unwanted relationship because they are they, they are being watched from community society or the, from the from the family. Um, if they can free themselves from an unwanted marriage or partnership, they are still confronted with uh, other obstacles such the, uh, such um, as the husband family, their own family and even the community. The community uh, exerts a lot of com uh, control and pressure to keep the concept of the family, the whole concept of the family alive. And in many cases, the issue is not if the woman is happy, if the person is happy in a marriage. Uh, it's much more important what others will say, and that's why uh, the, the, they will kept. Uh, they will be kept into a pressure 
their whole life. And therefore, women can be isolated and not informed about their rights. Because if they are informed, they can be, take action and try to, to uh, divorce or uh, separate. In, in many cases, the lack of information about uh, rights has led women to being told untruths about their rights. For example, she gets the, she gets the information that in the event of separation, the husband will automatically be granted the children uh, because she came to Europe through her marriage or uh, uh, to her marriage to him as a, a wife. Um, so the second point is a uh, lack, lack of the uh, legal regulations. Uh, what I mentioned, we are calling it actually in our work structural violence because uh, for many women, uh, there is a part of the violence. Um, in order for women to be able to lead in an independent life, actually the system must also be able to catch them. For this, women uh, could have to get an unbureaucratic resident permit, um, independent uh, of their husbands and uh, families uh, or his family or her uh, own family. As a further consequence, the financial security must also be guaranteed by the system. Uh, so that uh, she is encouraged to break away from an unwanted relationship. If these people, these persons, cannot be offered security uh, and future perspective, they will not uh, take steps out of fear, uh, fear to lose uh, their children, fear to lose their per resident permit or to be deported from here because of untruth uh, information. Um, the political decision makers and the countries uh, are required to define the legal options for everyone in such a way that no woman feels disadvantaged. Uh, most women remain in an unwanted marriage because they cannot rely on the system or the system uh, doesn't offer them enough guarantees uh, and safeguards for their life. And um, the second, the third, the third point I, I, I would mention, uh, it was actually a point of the speakers until now, and I'm glad that I can, uh, I can mention it also. Uh, the third point is religion and religion marriage uh, or divorce as a leverage. Yeah? Uh, but we, because we are facing many situations in our work with women and uh, in our counseling uh, services. So when women manage to break free from an, an unwanted marriage, the next point to watch is that they get the religiously contracted marriage as a means of pressure, even if, uh, even if they face many challenges and uh, are legally divorced uh, in Austria, some religious rituals, uh, rituals require an, an pronouncement uh, or declarations of husband's divorce, what in many Arabic countries means talaq. Uh, I think it's, it's, for, uh, it's, a, um, it's a word that uh, more people can understand. So uh, it's, it's very important that the husband speaks out the talaq. And if he doesn't want to speak out the talaq, uh, she, is, she will be, live in a captive uh, relationship. And at this point, if the husband doesn't want to declare or pronounce the divorce, the wife may remain separated from him, but cannot live an independent life uh, because she is still stuck in a religious uh, marriage. Um, and this circumstance um, means that the husband still sees himself as a married and makes demands on the wife. In, ma uh, in many cases, she is pressured to perform her marital duties, even though she is already legally divorced. And um, in, in most cases, it's actually a challenge to find a solution 
to the problem with representatives of the recognized religious communities. Um, in, in many constellations, the question arises, what kind of advice and practical support a woman in a situation of marital captivity may need uh, from the European perspective or Austrian perspective, but I, I'm, I'm pretty much uh, trying to to give our overview about Europe. So that's why the European perspective, it can be stated here that when immigrating, uh, women should first receive information about the country in which they will live in their mother tongue. Uh, we have situations when the family members or when husbands are uh, trying to, to give the information, they are telling her the untruths or if they are translating someone, if the family members uh, doesn't uh, speak German, so they are translating uh, wrong. Uh, that's why it's, it's very important to give them directly the information in their mother tongue. The structures, uh, the information about structures the, of the country, the entitlement of women to receive information on residence, labor or human rights, will empower them in the process of um, arriving in a new country. Um, and access to support offers must be made possible in a very transparent and understandable form for them. Um, women can also be empowered through targeted projects aimed at women. There are various projects in the mother tongue for women to empower them and to facilitate their access to information and support services um, without barriers. So they had they have the opportunity to ask in their mother tongue uh, uh, and and get the information and understand is as they need. And in, in summary, financial and legal security creating resources for women information and support and preventive measures are very important to, exp uh, to implement, uh, to, to give them the opportunity for a violence-free life. Um, and actually when the safety net is in place, uh, women also take advantage and build an, an independent life. Uh, as a result, what we see, strong women raise strong children and youth of the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mrs. We uh, Weyland. Uh, I just want to express my admiration for the impressive work that uh, your organization does and the creative ways in which they, uh, you reach out to women uh, who might otherwise maybe find it very difficult to get help. So thank you so much for what you're doing and keep on doing. Uh, for yeah. now, Mr. Uh, I, want to, um, I want to turn to Mr. Van Tricht. Uh, you founded uh, and are the managing director of the NGO, NGO Emancipator, based in Amsterdam. Emancipator seeks to contribute to make the world a better place by involving men and boys and working to achieve fairer and more equal gender relations. That means uh, breaking down uh, harm function of masculinity and uh, combating gender-based violence. And I understand that for uh, Emancipator has not material captivity as an issue, but your work uh, in engaging men in this field can certainly throw on a useful way. To give you the floor, Mr. Van Tricht. Yeah, thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, I'm honored to be here uh, and I hope to be able to give some valuable contribution. Indeed, I cannot claim to have much expertise on marital captivity, but I might be able to say some valuable things about engaging boys and men in promoting gender equality at large and in prevention of violence more specifically. Um, and I think it might be good to start still with introducing myself a bit uh, there. 
I, as an activist, I had an encounter with feminism and that pointed out to me that um, actually most of the problems in the world are created by men or at least men play important roles in, in creating them and sustaining them. And so they need to be part of the solution. And if we want to be part of the solution, we have to start working on ourselves. So the personal and the political are closely connected. We need to work on social and personal change or transformation at the same time. I studied women's studies. Uh, I specialized in men and masculinities. I worked with women's organizations in the Netherlands and internationally on different topics as violence prevention, uh, peace building, uh, sexuality, fatherhood, um, boys in education, um, uh, well, and so on. Uh, by now, it's 30, 32 years ago, I, I started all this and I think there is actually no topics in society that are not related to gender inequality and thus also to the role of boys and men and the ideas about masculinity we have. Um, at a certain moment in 2009, uh, I found out about Men Engage, uh, a global alliance of by now more than a thousand organizations working to engage boys and men in gender justice in, on all these topics and, and, and even different topics around the world. There are regional networks on all the continents in Europe, in Asia, in North America, South America and the Caribbean, in, in Africa. There is uh, regional networks uh, in the MENA region, in the Balkans. Uh, there's country networks in many countries in Africa uh, and, and one even in Belgium. Um, th there is a lot of local national organizations involved and actually Emancipator was founded uh, from the inspiration that we got from Men Engage to bring together all these often very fragmented uh, topics and initiatives. and, and to make clear by networking that something like uh, the transformation of masculinity is necessary and possible and that actually there is a lot of expertise on that already. Um, uh, by, by building capacity, uh, helping organizations and professionals to, to build capacity on this and of course by advocate, advocating, by making clear that we need to integrate a critical perspective on the role of boys, men and masculinities in social policies, uh, in, 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 in also um, discussions like here today. So I'm, I'm hesitant to, to say something concretely actually about uh, marital captivity. Um, uh, I think it is very important and this is what we, what we always say to see uh, this topic in the light of gender-based violence uh, more in general and that is a part of uh, uh, unequal gender relations, gender inequality, uh, gender injustice around the world. Um, I, I heard some things mentioned here before about very concrete uh, injustices and, 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 and examples of violence but also the more structural um, uh, issues of violence uh, uh, that can be economic, political. Um, so, so violence and inequality are in our analysis actually very much linked to each other and I think very clear that um, an issue like marital captivity is, is part of that structural injustice. Uh, um, and, and, and one more thing I, I think is important to stretch uh, um, and maybe this is also part of the strategy and we also know, we know that men have often, too often, uh, too much power uh, uh, and privileges and they are part of the problem and they are complicit in creating and, and, and perpetuating injustices and violence. And we know and we see that a lot of men want to be part of the solution. We also know and see that men um, uh, even though they may have the upper hand in gender relations in general, uh, they don't have the perfect lives either. They also have their gender related vulnerabilities and needs. Um, so th there is different ways that men can be approached as 
allies or partners in gender equality and violence prevention. And it's good to see that they are stakeholders as well, even if they sometimes or sometimes often don't seem to see that themselves in the first place. Um, and there is no quick fix, there is no easy solution to get men involved, but I'm happy to see that there is this global movement of men wanting to be part of the change, um, especially in these times where we also see the regressive and reactionary forces growing stronger. Um, so it's also the time that we need all men to take their position, to speak out, to break the silence and to choose to be part of the solution. Um, yeah, I, I think actually maybe it's more helpful to to give the possibility to ask me some questions that I might reflect on than just out of the blue trying to say some more. I put our, the link to our website and, I, uh, and to Men Engage in the chat and I would like to, I will also put, um, put forward some information about our current campaign um, to close with, uh, we, we've been asking men for the past two years, what kind of men do you wish to be or wish to see in the world? We also ask this question to women and, and other people who don't identify as men. Um, uh, inspired by Mahatma Gandhi's uh, quote, uh, be the change you wish to see in the world, we ask what kind of you men you wish to see in the world. And now, since today, we are going international with this campaign, asking men to speak out the men I want to be, uh, to, to show also the diversity of, of ways of being men, of, uh, of being human, of being a partner, stakeholder, ally in these issues. So I'll copy paste that also in the chat. Please, the men here, uh, join us. Please, uh, other people here, uh, uh, share forward, ask men in your uh, network in your community, in your surroundings, uh, engage in this conversation because it's one one man at a time that we change the world. Um, so I'll copy copy paste this here, and I see Margrethe already wants to ask us questions. So yes. thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Van Tricht, for your really important, really. Uh, on the same page with you uh, that men uh, need to be allies and combating any form of violence against young girls and, and women. And I hope with you and all the rest of the attendees here that we have soon a generation of men that the first allies and combating any forms of, uh, of violence. So uh, I see that Margreet uh, wants to take the floor. Margreet, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh... I find the uh, presentation of Jens very interesting, although it's not specific on uh, marital captivity. But my question to him, and also I think to Melton, is uh, I think it's it's very important to engage uh, uh, men and boys. Uh, but when we're talking about marital captivity, um, it's also about the whole uh, structure and uh, the whole. Uh, in, in Poland and Hungary, it's called family values, uh, IDs within communities. Um, so we don't need to engage the men and boys individually uh, to reflect on their masculinity and things like that, because then we're talking about men and boys who are already thinking about it and, and wanting to take a step. But my question is, when it comes to, to uh, communities, whether religious or not, who are kind of a conservative uh, when it comes to issues of, of women's rights, let's put it that way. What steps could we take to, to um, well, to start a discussion at least uh, within these communities? Do, we, do you have any experience with that and any ideas on that? Mr. Van Tricht, you have the floor. Try to give to make start. Um, thank you for this question, and it, it, it's true. I mean, we in men engage. I think in general we work more and more from the what is called the social ecological model uh, to achieve real social change. We need interventions on different levels at the same time and multiple interventions. So we need 
institutional change, we need community change, we need organizational change, we need interpersonal change, and we need individual change. And we need all that. There is not one level that we can change it all. We need to work on all these levels and not with one-time single interventions. Um, so, and, and individuals are also um, people who play important roles on the other levels. So we need also leadership. We need personal leadership. We need examples. Um, and um, I think on an institutional level, we need also clarity and we need norms and we need regulations and facilitations. Um, um, for me, Men Engaged community is so inspiring because we see globally that there are so many examples of people doing this kind of world work in all kinds of traditional communities. And I want to stretch that even though in Western Europe we tend to think we're not so traditional, but in many ways uh, we and white people and, and, and et cetera, we are also very traditional in the way we look at gender roles and, and gender relations and, and masculinity and femininity. And in all these communities, we need to find and strengthen the pioneers and early adopters who wish to change these things who are the progressive forces. Uh, so in a way, we need also to combine our strategies from top down or, or from a global overview and to bottom up empowerment of those forces, of those people, of those people taking leadership to change on all these different levels. And Men Engage is really a, a, a fascinating global community that has a lot of experience and expertise in doing this work, trying this work uh, in, in all kinds of different communities on all uh, kind of different topics and, and, and related to all these intertwined social struggles. Uh, I hope this, uh, this can at least be part of the answer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Van Tricht. Uh, now we are going to open up the questions from the audience. Please use the chat function in blue jeans. Excuse me. On Facebook. Yes. Ah, excuse me, Mrs. Wayland. You want to respond as well? Excuse yes, me. Yes, very shortly. I will. I would like. I would like. I actually, um, I'm fully uh, uh, agree with Mr. Uh, van, van Tricht, and he said everything what I want to mention. Keep it short. I don't want actually to uh, imp ex impression that all men are perpetrators, but we, are, we are have uh, many cases men or young uh, men, not as a perpetrator. There are only a result of education of their families. So everything actually begins with, um, with the education at the family. That's why we have to see this as a package. We cannot pick up only a woman from the family to achieve uh, uh, something, uh, to change something. Yeah. So if we, we uh, start with a package, we have to work with the family first and after that, we can we can separate the family members in gender. In my opinion, it doesn't. Uh, we 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 can skip the the gender and say we have uh, we have human rights and all the family member. We are human. So uh, for me, it's the basic work to begin with the family and. The, the the biggest chance to actually to give them the information in their mother tongues so because because we have families here um, they are living for several years and they can they are not able to speak German so if I I'm trying to inform them only in German they will understand half of uh, everything and uh, still keep uh, their concept so education is uh, number one, um, uh, working with the families, uh, very important. Um, not all men are perpetrators, they are also victims. So that is number three, because we are a, 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 a 
Women Counseling Center, but especially at the Coordination Center. Every several years we have a client who is a man and he wants, because he, he, he is abducted and wants to come back to Austria. So um, I would like to underline that both of, both of the, the target groups can be seen as um, as uh, victims and not only perpetrators outside of men. Thank you. Uh, now, so as already mentioned, uh, it's time for the question from the audience. Uh, you can put your questions through the chat function uh, to in uh, six to which we can uh, deal with all the questions. While we're doing that, uh, Mrs. Weyland, you already uh, elaborated a little bit on the on, on the presentation of Mr. Stutt. Do you want to add something or ask questions or comment on something specifically, or uh, you have the floor? Did you manage to find the audio? Mrs. Weyland, you have the floor. Actually, I I, to, I I have already said what I want to say, so, yeah. Great, okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Van Thank Trees. you, Your turn, would you like to or ask questions to uh, Ms. Weyland? No, I'm sorry. I think I think it's been clear enough for me so far. Maybe, uh, of course, always the question that I would like to ask is, what do you think men could or should do, or how how can we improve the strategies to make men part of the solution? I think this is always for us an in, in, important learning point. So, if if you have any reflection on that, I would love to hear. Men uh, are only. <laughs> Uh, men are only the uh, part of the solution. So actually, it begins from for me uh, in in, uh, in kindergarten. So we have to start with the informations very early. But if we couldn't achieve this point, uh, showing the men or youth the other perspective of the of the world, that because they are, uh, in my opinion. Um, they are growing up with a family pressure, and the family is uh, the family has the interest of uh, uh, pressure only because they have to be like the family. So if they couldn't see another perspective, uh, they will they will uh, they will react actually like their families do. So uh, I see the opportunity on this way to give them. The opportunity to see another perspective, what I do with my clients uh, always, to give them the opportunity to, to, to show them a, another perspective of life or to ask them what they want to do in their life and to, to be concentrated or the, on their perspective and not only their traditions, values or families, yeah, to show them that you are an individual and you have your, your dreams, you have your perspective, let us concentrate on your perspective and not only on your traditions, because your traditions, yeah, they, can, uh, they can be part of you, but your life belongs to you. So this is are the, the, the discussions we have with our clients to achieve an, an, uh, a solution. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, maybe I would like to ask the panelists first part of the session, uh, Sherin, Kim and uh, Francesca, are there any comments, questions that they want to share with us? Please go ahead and take the floor. If, if I may, yes, thank you. Please do. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to, to stress once again, uh, because we're addressing more um, uh, broader issues such as prevention, awareness raising, um, gender equality. I, I just wanted to stress in particular the importance of um, the convention from that angle. So Article 14 
um, of the convention um, requests that um, the state parties include teaching materials on issues such as equality between women and men, non-stereotype gender roles, uh, mutual respect, nonviolent conflict resolution, um, in interpersonal relationships, as well, of course, um, on the various forms of gender-based um, violence. Um, and, and this is a, an aspect that, of course, Gravio looks at systematically um, in each and every one of its um, monitoring of uh, countries. Um, and I just wanted to also raise your attention to another publication, uh, actually two publications that might be of interest. So the first one, and I'll just, I will put it in the chat. Um, it's a recent study on Article 14 um, uh, on education and on, on basically um, uh, going into depth on, on, on the issue of education in preventing violence uh, and ensuring uh, gender equality. Um, this is the first one and I'll put it in the chat. And the second one is uh, the horizontal review of Grevio evaluation uh, baseline re reports, uh, which is this one. And um, where once again, uh, basically Grevio does an overview of the findings of the shortcomings that have been identified in each one of the countries that have been evaluated by Grevio, including on the issue of education and awareness raising and prevention in general. And best practices are there as well um, that can always be uh, interesting to look at. Um, so I'll put those in the chat. Thank you. Uh, for comments, um, I don't know, Shireen, uh, because I'm writing an uh, uh, Seeing in the chat that you prefer to write it over there. Maybe we can try just a little green. The floor is yours, and otherwise we will continue. Okay, we will continue then. Uh, I don't know if there are any other questions. If not, we will uh, continue. Um, we are coming to the end uh, of our time this morning, uh, so. Uh, I would like to ask to our two speakers if um, if you would like to make any final comments, and particularly, would you like to make any recommendation from your perspective about the action that states should be taking in order to prevent and combating uh, material captivity? Uh, Mr. Van Tricht, would you like to go first? Uh, sorry, I was a bit distracted. Someone came in here. Could you ask me the question again? Oh, you got you got stuck now, or I got stuck. I think Furat is also losing connection. The question was if you have any concrete recommendation. Yeah, I, I, I find I repeat myself uh, uh, by saying, uh, uh, please, please uh, include men as part of the problem analysis and part of the solution uh, on all these issues. That's actually w what we often see is missing or that goes without saying, but then it doesn't get enough attention. So yeah, that, I think that is really important. Yeah, yeah, and use the carrot and the stick. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I don't see food at Benchica anymore, so I'll take over then. Uh, uh, Melton, do you want anything to add or? Actually, I, I added in my uh, in my speech, but uh, in a summary, I would like to uh, repeat that financial and support or legal aid and assistance. I'm I'm only looking to my notes. Uh, yeah, uh, they will empower them. Actually, because we we were talking all the time about empowerment, I have I make the experience that women and girls they are. Uh, uh, already empowered. They only need actually the, the support to, uh, to bring it um, to action. So they are ready, they are empowered. And the proof of this is the first contact to our services. Once they call us, uh, it shows the first uh, empowerment that they are ready to take action. And we, all of us, have to support us with several uh, 
in their several issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Afurat is with us again, I see. Maybe. Um, May I maybe add a final comment as well? Yes. Yes, Please. so um, I was very much talking uh, from the perspective of uh, academic research earlier, but I have been active also um, within the, the organization uh, Karama Europe, Muslim Women Lawyers for Human Rights, and we have been <coughs> um, doing two kinds of uh, activities that actually are very important in terms of, of, of prevention and were part of the recommendations that I uh, also wrote down in my, um, in my PhD. On the one hand, um, we are uh, providing workshops that tend to strengthen the internormative legal awareness of uh, Belgian Muslim women, especially in, um, in, in the area of Brussels, and we will be conducting um, this kind of, of workshops in the future as well. So the idea is basically that women, um, whether they are in a, a situation of family conflict or not, uh, doesn't matter, are, are able to ask all the questions they have about what rights do I have and how does this work under Belgian law, under uh, foreign law, uh, under Islamic law, and what does that concretely mean for, for me? Being able to, to con concretely discuss this kind of issues is, is very important in terms of, of prevention, but also in order to, to be able for these women to find, identify places where they can um, raise, uh, raise their questions. On the other hand, training for professionals um, is very important as well. And so we have been uh, setting up a training program um, that focuses on uh, mediation uh, for Muslim families. And uh, in this, we can see it much um, broader than just uh, Muslim families, of course. Um, but the idea is to identify uh, which kind of particular issues uh, might play a role, what then is the role of, of social norms, religion, um, uh, legal factors, etc., and what does that concretely mean for uh, actors on, um, on the ground. And so I think in, in, in the future, these kind of actions would be um, would be important to uh, to be supported, and and, and I, I highlighted earlier on that networks of expertise are very important in this. So we try to collaborate, have imams, um, have uh, lawyers, have um, uh, people from the judiciary, and and bring them to, to, together to reflect about possible um, avenues. Uh, remedies and uh, preventive solutions. So I, I, I just wanted to, 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 to add that uh, I, I think uh, we, we have uh, several actors here that are uh, uh, yeah, a kind of uh, potential members of, of such, a, such a network. So I think the opportunity today to hear um, about one another's um, uh, actions was already interesting. And Thank you very much. Uh, then I uh, want to make some concluding uh, remarks as a rapporteur on this uh, issue. Um, just to, some thoughts, uh, what I'm going to take from this, uh, this webinar. And I see uh, a lot of speakers are adding information to the chat. That's very welcome. And if uh, after the closing of this session, if you come up with other relevant uh, information, please send it to the Secretariat, you have the, uh, the information. And if people are looking at this webinar, uh, have information, uh, you can also send it to uh, uh, the Equality Committee of the Parliamentary Assembly of uh, the Council of Europe. I think you can find the address. Uh, I, I, because we have only have a few minutes, I want to take some, we, the report will be on finding solutions. So I will focus on, on solutions uh, I heard today. Uh, to start with the possibility to have a no-fault divorce everywhere. Um, the role of diplomacy also uh, uh, to make sure in contact with other countries that uh, divorces are recognized. Uh, from the one country to the other country without uh, problems. Uh, breaking the wall of separation, uh, uh, as Kim mentioned, between the religion and the uh, law and policy makers. 
uh, also making women to see themselves as right being persons, I found that also very important because I think that's the, that's the next step of empowerment. The one is the one that you think you have a voice, but the translation that it, it also means you have a right is a very important one. About the Istanbul Convention, I think we have to elaborate on how it can help, so which provisions uh, can uh, be used but also to make clear that it does not fully cover uh, uh, marital captivity and uh, that maybe it should. Uh, also, because what Meltem says that is that um, it is important to have definitions of all forms of violence against women uh, and I think marital captivity is a form of violence against women as it, it limits their autonomy. Uh, that all definitions has to have to be recognized. So I think we also should see whether maybe it should be in the Istanbul Convention. Well, and, and some other things, independent residence permit um, was mentioned, and also resources and support to make it really possible to have uh, an independent life. Well, there there has been said lots uh, lots more, but but well, I think we. Uh, um, we all have taken note of it and we will try to include it in the report. Uh, if you have anything to add, add you can find me and uh, once again, uh, thank you very, very much.